Welcome to our first Data Visualization Society Fireside Chat. Um, it's early in the morning here and we're ready to roll. I'm very excited. This is the first one that of these that we're doing. Um, it's on color theory. So if there are any kinks, we're still working out the system a little bit. Um, we have three great panelists here to talk through today. Um, the way we're going to do questions, if you have questions, throw them in the chat. Uh, I have some pre sort of figured out questions that we're going to start with. Um, and then we'll move on to participant questions as the session goes on. So welcome. Um, again, this is on color theory for data visualization. So if that's what you're we're expecting, you are in the right place. And just a quick shout out to Excella, who is providing us the Zoom today. So thank you to them. And our first panelist, Alan. Hi. Yeah, so my name's Alan Wilson. Um, I work for Adobe. Um, if you've been in the data visualization Slack, you probably better know me by that little avatar than my actual face. <laughs> so maybe we can connect the two today. Um, if you go to the next slide, I talk a little bit about some of the stuff I do at Adobe. I work uh, primarily on the Experience Cloud, which is Adobe's enterprise software. Uh, includes analytics um, and a lot of technology that helps people uh, enhance their websites and things of that nature. Um, one of the things I do there is I help the Experience Cloud with the adoption of our design system spectrum. There's a whole team that owns that, but I've been uh, pretty heavily involved in that since uh, day one. Um, another project that I don't own, but I have helped out with is Leonardo Color, uh, Nate Baldwin is the mastermind behind that, but I've been uh, helping out with that project. Um, data Illustrator and Lincoln are two data visualization authoring tools that we've uh, played with here at Adobe. Nothing um, uh, out in the public just yet, but we are working on some fun stuff in that arena. And then uh, just this past two weeks, I've been helping out with a side project called COVID Atlas to make it easier to get county level data, uh, uh, worldwide county, worldwide data at the county-ish level. So anyway, I'm excited to talk about color today. Thanks, Alan. Teresa Marie is another, our other panelist, our second panelist. Hi. Well, let's see. My primary focus for the last couple of years has been on applying color theory to digital media and visualization. I've written a book on the subject and I just love it very, very much. I have had previous visualization experience and founding two visualization centers. And I've served as a color expert for visualization centers at Stanford University, University of California, Davis and University of Utah, among many others. I've lectured a lot with regards to my book at um, SIGGRAPH, IEEE Viz, uh, SIGCHI and many other places including the Transportation Research Board. So I've been looking at practitioners recently as well. And I, I just love color more than anything. I use a lot of apps. I don't know if you can move another slide forward here and I'll show you some of those, uh, some of the ways I look at uh, visualization. Can someone? Um, why, don't, why don't we get through in all the panelists okay. and then we'll flip back to that. Um, so, anyway, I use a lot of tools and I have a blog and I use a new tool every uh, single day. Thank you. And Julia. Oh, Julia. <laughs> How's it going? Um, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay, good. Making sure. Uh, so yeah, I guess I do a number of things. Um, you say I'm an information designer. I have a background more in the science side of things and research, but I also had a graphic design practice alongside that and a professional exhibiting art practice. And I kind of merged all of those together when it was time to be one human being with all of these skills, as opposed to having like three different CVs and navigating the world that way. Um, so I started a company called Pixels and Plans. And uh, through that company, uh, we basically make data visualization products and infographics and um, different knowledge mobilization initiatives for um, government organizations. Uh, I live in Canada, so mainly Canadian ones. Um, and uh, also uh, uh, organizations like NGOs that are funded by the government um, in, in usually science fields. And so just trying to make their um, 
their research, you know, more accessible to the public, or at least, you know, somehow, um, you know, a little more approachable and helping them with their data viz needs. Um, I also founded a nonprofit organization called Art the Science. Um, and Art the Science is, I guess, kind of really a merger of creativity and art and, um, and science in a way to uh, promote collaboration between scientists and artists so that um, they can create uh, works of art that could then be distilled down to the public so that they can experience science in a different way. Um, we uh, have a, a residency program where we actually put an artist in a lab full time um, for a couple of weeks and, uh, and see what comes out of that. Um, and then I'm also the partnership director for the Data Visualization Society. Um, so colored um, for me really has uh, kind of been in my life the whole time. Um, when I, I, I grew up in, in Russia and I came to Canada uh, when I was 10 and my mom, the classic kind of immigrant said, you know, art make you no money, you have to do science. And so because that happened, I ended up um, during my high school career going to the art gallery uh, every Thursday, it was free for like five years. So I, I, I bonded with aesthetic and color theory and all of that through giving myself that art education that I wasn't allowed to have. And then because I think, you know, th th that really helped build the foundation for me when I stepped into creating, exhibiting art or designing or doing any of these things, because I think color is such a huge part of that. Great. Um, I'm excited to have all of these color enthusiasts and experts talk about color and data visualization. Um, so my first question today is, what are some resources you use for color? Alan, do you want to start? Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, one of the things I've been using a lot lately is uh, Leonardo Color. Uh, it's a tool that, like I mentioned, I work with Nate Baldwin on, um, and it's really nice for making sequential color palettes. And one of the things that makes it unique is uh, it's contrast ratio based. So your primary inputs as you're building the system is what are your desired contrast ratios, which are really important for accessibility, but also just general readability of, of your visualizations. And so you can control quite a bit of parameters and you have all these 3D charts to help you how, understand how it traverses through 3D color space. One of the things you learn early on working with color is when, you, when you're working with color, you don't talk about color, you talk about uh, the different uh, aspects of color, your hue, your, uh, now I'm blanking, luminosity and things. There's always three dimensions to color, which always makes it hard to work with. Uh, and this tool helps with a lot of those things. Um, and uh, in the past, when I'm uh, before this, I used a lot of uh, Chroma.js color scale helper, um, which is also a, a really great tool for sequential and diverging color palettes. And when it comes to categorical color, um, there's a lot of tools out there. I haven't found one that actually works in practice. I toy around with a lot of them and I think they're kind of cool, but when it usually comes to category for color, I just manually pick my colors. Um, and it's actually a quite painful process. So I'm looking forward to the day. There's a really nice categorical color tool out there. Julia or um, Theresa Marie. Do you want to share some thoughts about what resources you use for color? Sure, I have uh, two slides if we want to put them up. One yep, of them is, I can pull them up. Thank you so much. One of them is sort of a flow chart way of making a. This one? Yeah, I'm okay. sort of telling you these are some ways for looking at this particular visualization, which is a hurricane visualization. And so I have three or four approaches I'll mention here. Color design, designing the, actually the color parameters. I use um, the Interaction of Color app from, based on Joseph Albers' book that's available from Yale University Press. For scientific visualization, I use a lot of color harmony concepts from a tool called Palladium. In terms of sort of selecting a color tool, uh, a color space randomly, there's a research tool called Colorgorical, and then Color Brewer is sort of the classic. And then I also use a colorblind simulator. 
the image below um, shows you the hurricane and the three different types of colorblindness uh, items, which we may discuss later. I use another one called Cobalis. Now, if you want to go to the next slide, I've done a list for you of all the various tools that I use. Since we're talking about Adobe, I love Adobe Capture, the free mobile app for going out and capturing photos and then knowing the particular color parameters. So like I'll go out into my garden and Mother Nature makes some cool palettes and I'll capture an image from my garden and then capture those colors. Pantone Studio is a great library um, for the iPhone that provides various Pantone colors that are available. You can also use it for image capture from, an, um, from a photograph. Adobe Color Online is an online tool that's probably the, what I'd call the grandmother of color tools. It's been around for a long time. It used to be called Adobe Cooler. It's now called Adobe Color. So Alan, I'm focusing on your company a little bit here. Then Palladium's Color Scheme Designer, I, I covered Color Brewer from Cynthia Brewer is a pretty classic tool in terms of looking at the categorical diverging uh, uh, color maps. Color Moves is an online research tool, which is kind of a lot of fun. I done it, done at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And Viz Palette is a neat one from some of the members of the Data Viz Soci Visualization Society, which is a very powerful tool for information visualization. So I use a lot more tools than that, but these are just a few that might be of interest. Julia? Thoughts? Yeah, so I think um, since Jason May and Alan covered kind of the the internet, you know, resources and, and tools, um, maybe I'll I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of inspiration because I feel like color really is kind of in the data viz itself and how you actually work with presenting your variables and data. But there's also kind of a branding side to this as well if you're doing visualization. Um, so maybe I'll talk about that piece of it. Um, so I guess for starters, when I think about color, it's ultimately about the client that I'm working with, uh, if it's not a self-directed creative project, because they'll likely have branding guidelines that I have to follow. And so I will be limited potentially to, you know, whatever color scheme they have. And I'm trying to maybe even have that, you know, seep into the visualization products as well. Um, so, and I, I noticed, you know, that that's one of the first things that I always ask for, are the, you know, are there branding guidelines? Where are they? Can you send them to me so I can, can so I can view them? Um, Coming from like, just mentioning some of the tools that have not been mentioned, one uh, that I like if um, if you're absolutely kind of stuck and you can't think of a starting color at all and you don't have branding guidelines is uh, something called the Flat UI Color Picker. It has some really neat colors on there and um, you can just start off with that and then of course you can go into something like Adobe Color and, and derive a palette that way. But Amy, if you could flip to the, the middle of my two slides. Um, and Teresa Marie already alluded to this a little bit and this is something that that I extensively um, do because I think it's a really interesting exercise yeah no not that one the one before this one um, so for, for no the one in the middle yeah that one thanks um, yeah so for me I really it's kind of like a nature does it best <laughs> um, rule in terms of inspiration or starting points and so i use something like pixabay um, if i don't take my own photos which i do so you know either either works but i do think it's a really great exercise to pull colors um, from natural photographs and i know maybe some of them have been processed and tinted but i still think there's interest there in in terms of looking at a starting point for color or even color palettes because really interesting color palettes exist in, in photography um, and then um, may I have that first slide? Yeah, and so kind of just even getting a little bit more granular in terms of, of resources, you know, I'm working on like a, a, a beach class data visualization now and something that I've been looking at even there is kind of the choices that that production has made in terms of manufacturing color, but that in itself is also a very kind of color limiting, if you will, palette. So. I'm, I'm exploring what that color palette could be, but that's a very, again, you know, example of industry to nature kind of, I guess, co combination thereof in terms of inspiring color. And then of course, all of the amazing software tools that my fellow panelists have mentioned. I just wanted to mention, there's also a tool that's similar to what you were talking about, Julia, called Pantone Color Finder which is just an array of colors. It's like a, a palette of all the Pantone colors that one can select from as a starting point too. Yeah, and they made a kid's book out of it too. <laughs> You've seen that, yeah. 
Um, so my next question that I'm, I'm going to move on to is how do you address color deficiencies like color blindness? I think I mentioned that uh, I sort of did an initial mention of it in terms of I mentioned the Cobliss tool, which is an online tool that will let you take an image through it and then see the various types of color blindness that have been determined. There's uh, red blind color and blindness, which means the red cone doesn't function properly, which is protonopia. There's deuteronopia, which means the green cone doesn't function properly. And those are the two largest color blindness um, parameters that have been documented. And then this tritonopia, which is the blue cone, um, not functioning properly. I don't know, I skipped a little bit, but our eyes have um, three cones in the, built in them that support red, green, and blue. And when those cones don't function properly, that's where uh, a color deficiency results. And there's about 4% of the population that tends to, can have a color deficiency. So that's how I do. Um, I'll, just to say, I learned this by being out in the field. I did an um, online graph that had a green background and I drew a magenta line. And one of my colleagues at the um, University of Utah told me he couldn't see that line being drawn. And so I put a blue line and I realized that what he had was deuteronopia. He couldn't see green and pinks together. So uh, in practice, I put a blue line on there. That's how I learned about color blindness the hard way. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, one thing I, I recently learned just by reading an article and listening to a radio lab episode is culture kind of plays into how we um, see color and interact with color. Um, I learned that as a native Russian speaker, we have um, something called Sini, which is dark blue and Globoy, which is light blue. And apparently, according to some of these studies, folks that, um, that have that um, can really quickly differentiate between the two, which I think is kind of interesting, but also leads into this bigger conversation of like individual color perception. Um, at the end of the day, coming from scientific publishing, um, before I even got into kind of color, um, and maybe my last slide there can, <laughs> can, can, we can bring that up. Um, and, you know, I know that uh, just we mentioned some of the tools where you can actually put your image in and then see how um, it would be viewed with color deficiency, which I think is really useful. Um, at the end of the day, if it's something that is extremely um, important, um, you don't have to use color. And I know that's anticlimactic to a color theory <laughs> discussion, but this, I, I put this together because I thought it was kind of fun from, um, from a past kind of exploration in publishing academically where our figures couldn't have color. So we actually weren't allowed at the time to use color to differentiate between anything. We had to use pattern. The only thing I would kind of caution against, and I'm not actually even, you know, saying whether this is a good practice or not in this particular image. This is more like a diagramic kind of, you know, foray into this. In fact, I encourage discussion around patterns. I'm sure there's people who have like on academic backgrounds in, in, in this, but I did notice, you know, that care has to be taken in terms of, you know, kind of the overall shading of the whole thing, because you can obviously use that for emphasis, whether it's too light or too dark. But um, I think that, yeah, definitely using tools to check what your um, final product looks like. But if you can't do that, then there is potential to, to use um, patterns or maybe even patterns in, in combination with color to, to help. But maybe, maybe Tristan, you can speak to that. I know that you have kind of more like a, a theoretical background on this, but I do think patterning is something that could be used as well. Well, I'll give you a summary of what you said, and that is get it right in black and white. If you get it right <laughs> in black and white, just get the shade, then you can add color. So that's the way I would summarize what you said. No. Which I, I agree with that. Yeah, I, I, I think that's really good advice. And I, when I think about this, I, I kind of think of uh, dealing with uh, color vision deficiencies in, in two areas. Uh, when you've got the sequential color palettes, when you're uh, trying to visualize numbers with color, then yeah, it's you large numbers need to be really dark and your small numbers need to be really light. And it's just that gradient and really you can do, there's a lot of really cool things you can do with color within those rule, that rule space, so long as you don't break that rule of an even gradation from light to dark. Um, 
yeah, which is again why I like those tools. They help me keep that one rule in place while I can be creative with the actual hues and the, the other things that I can play with. Um, and in categorical color, uh, it's it's a different uh, ball game altogether because the goal is to encode different values. So the goal isn't uh, to communicate a number, it's to say this thing is different from this thing. Patterns are a great way to do that. Um, and when you're working with colors, the thing is to make sure you don't have any conflicting colors. So there's, it's a lot of trial and error, you know, you come up with three or four colors and then you throw it through a bunch of color blind simulators and you see if it works. And you're like, ah, oh, that one just, they're almost identical on that one. So let me change it this way. And then you fix it in one uh, kind of color deficiency and you create it in another. Um, and so it can be a bit uh, of work, but in my uh, experience, if you want a truly accessible categorical color palette, you can't get beyond three or four colors. Um, if you want to, to have colors that are kind of close, um, you can maybe bump that up to five or six, but it gets really rough uh, when you want to be uh, rigidly colorblind uh, safe when it comes to categorical color. I also found with um, the use of black and white, just coming back to that for a minute, um, where I think for me was was kind of a, a consideration. Uh, we had a client that actually required all of the designs to be done in only black and white, which I thought at first was kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> um, and I, it was one of my favorite projects, but ultimately is because the audience was printing these reports um, overseas and the, the, our client conveyed to us that um, the perception there would be if you see any kind of gray when you print that out, um, that that is color, but they don't actually um, put resources into purchasing colored ink in some of these places. And so that's just not something that they have accessibility to. So they, they print their products in black and white based on that. So if you design in black and white, as that as the intent, then that that particular segment, that audience, when they receive the product, they don't feel that they're missing anything by by seeing that gray and assuming it's color that they just don't have access to. I thought that that was something that was interesting that came up through my experience with with, with doing client work. I'm an advocate. Oh, sorry, go. I'm an advocate for redundancy. So combining what Julia and, and Alan have said, I think if you have the like the cross hatching or the um, various shading methods that Julia showed earlier in her slide, and then you combine it with Alan's notion of categorical colors reducing the numbers, you have doubled your chances of it working if the if it doesn't work in terms of uh, being able to differentiate between the colors. You've got the shading to go back to, and then if people see the colors. Our next question sort of relates to this. It's a question from the audience, so. Um, how do you handle multiple colored lines on a line graph where you may have like hundreds of lines? How do you address the scenario from the perspective of color blindness? And I'm going to add accessibility. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I'll take a stab at that. Um, yeah, we've all done it. We've all created a line chart with a hundred lines and a hundred different colors, just whatever the tool that we're using provides by default usually. And, uh, it looks horrible and it's super inaccessible um, and it, it, it just doesn't work very well, right? So the my favorite uh, technique when dealing with a lot of lines, because sometimes there's a lot of value in those lines, is to emphasize one at a time. So make all of the lines uh, neutral color, usually a, a gray of some sort, uh, and then pick one line, the line you want to tell a story about, label that line clearly, give it a bright color, a uh, blue or a red or something that really stands out, make sure it sits on top of the other lines, doesn't get buried underneath all the grays. Um, and if you want to tell a story about all 100 lines and use small multiples, and so you have 100 line charts, each all gray with one red line, but the line that is red changes for each chart. Um, and that's one way to approach it. That's one of my favorite approaches for solving that particular problem. I mean, I really like interactive visualizations just for that exact reason. <laughs> when you're in a giant mess of lines, you can hover over them to see what it is. But that's not always the case. So, um, I mean, I think that you've, 
you can try patterning lines but that's way worse so i wouldn't recommend that yeah it's 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 hard it's 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 kind of i don't know if we have come to kind of like one go-to best practice solution in this space yet well i feel like alan must have read my mind or something because i'm working on a color study right now this post on my blog called in miniatures where i'm using small multiples we're doing exactly what he's saying having multiple small images of a particular graph so that's amazing alan uh, coming at a cosmic collision here yeah which which actually brings me to a, a point that i think we'll hit on as we talk about color anytime is color isn't always the answer right sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to not use color to to just use black and white to use patterns to use small multiples to use the other tools in our toolbox often we we i think expect a little too much of color and while it's a really powerful tool we should uh, use them in combination with everything else if we're going to really maximize uh, our effective communication um so along these same lines uh someone's wondering if there are any guidelines or general rules of how to make graphs accessible using color What do you mean by the word accessible? Because are we talking about color deficiency? Because that gets to making sure you choose colors that folks can see by running it through a simulator or doing what Julie said about cross-hatching. I don't know if there's another kind of accessibility that is being phrased about that, but there's many yeah, ways. So accessible meaning um, both color deficiency and then working with like accessibility standards and WCAG guidelines for color contrast. Well, you know, there's the ultimate example would be someone who is told is blind. And that would be alt tags text sort of trying to describe telling the stories of visualization trying to describe it that way. That that would be what I would do. And I've done that before. I have a very dear friend from college actually, who is blind and continues to operate in the world today. And uh, that's how I describe my visualizations to her as if I'm writing a story. So I do each particular line or each particular component of the visualization as in terms of a story, uh, sort of a big alt tag if you want to look at it that way. But I don't think she's ever seen one, she's never seen one of my visualizations, but hopefully she's understood one of my visualizations. And I think to kind of maybe summarize it into, you know, obviously not kind of making like official guidelines on the fly here, but definitely just even the use of one of these tools, which will kind of prototype the, the various deficiencies that exist. And even seeing that I think is important because if you've done that, you at least have an idea of how someone else might see your work. Like, I think that's probably, we can all agree that that is a thing that you should be aware of and, and, and doing whether or not, you know, to get into granularity of, okay, if you have eight, variables you must use this color scheme you know i don't know but but i think the first step is to think about it because i think oftentimes that's not something that occurs so i think that that's really important one of the yeah. things okay on sorry <laughs> on that note like uh you can make a chart that meets all of wcag's most rigid standards but isn't useful to someone uh, with or without colorblind deficiencies. Um, and on the other side of things, you can make a chart that actually is extremely useful to anyone and yet doesn't meet those guidelines. And so I know that's something that WCAG is working to evolve to, to especially as it relates to charts. Right now, most of their guidelines have to do with the readability of text. And when it comes to reading charts, they classify them as images and they just kind of say, yeah, do whatever. It doesn't matter so much so long as there's an alternative way to understand it, like alt text. Um, and I personally find the, those uh, guidelines not very useful. Um, and I'm looking forward to some better guidelines in the future. And in the meantime, I think Julia's advice is spot on. Like, do what you can to empathize, get in that person's shoes, see what they see, and make something that would work for you in that scenario. And I think you'll be far more successful than trying to, you know, get some three to one contrast ratio and uh, other things like that. Uh, anyway. Right. As both Alan and Julie was were talking, 
I've also experimented using things like sonification, which is attaching a sound to a particular set of data. That is tricky. It's a tricky thing to do, but I, I've done that. And another one is to try to create a tactile situation if you're going to interface with your client. But if you're doing it remotely or like online, that still can be very difficult to do. Sonification is helpful, however. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. There's um, an art project that um, my, my partner Owen Fernley and I worked on called 88 Years, where we actually attempted to sonify age. Um, and what we did is we assigned um, a birth year, um, starting in 2011 all the way to 1924, to the piano keyboard. And so it was very easy to then hear folks that were young because they were on the high end and folks that were older that were on the low the low end of, of a whole keyboard and so um when you played someone's age you didn't actually need necessarily a numerical value to, to detect that there were maybe different age groups in the room if you played that chord for th that particular group um this of course was a, was more of like an art exhibition that went um in in an art gallery but it was interesting to have folks come in and um, and play their age and, and have that kind of audio correspond to a numerical value. Okay, next question, I think. Um, do you have a favorite color palette that you use across different projects or do you pick a different palette every time you meet one? Audience, man. It's about my audience. <laughs> I like cerulean blue, like personally. <laughs> like if everything could be in cerulean blue, amazing. Uh, but I, I let the audience kind of drive that <laughs> if it's if it's client work. Um. Yeah, <laughs> I I agree with Julia. Like you got to look at what you're trying to communicate, and uh, again, colors of powerful communication tool and I think does a better job of tapping into emotion than almost any other tool in our toolbox. And so take advantage of that and, and think about what the story is. Now that said, my my go-to when I'm exploring data and I'm just trying to understand things and encode things, I use Veritas a lot. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> so, uh, but I, it's in a lot of uh, uh, software for visualization and I, I find that it's a really nice looking color scheme and you can throw that on a lot of things and instantly it looks better um, and it can also help you understand how things are encoded. Right. Well, my favorite color is orange and that can be a challenge because it ends up being that Tableau actually uses a blue and orange palette, which is a sort of a complementary color palette. And that's something that I like to use quite a bit. So, I tend to default to that. I tend to default to a lot of blues and purples with regards to, I've done a lot of hurricane visualization. And in that situation, I default to blues and purples with orange wind vectors. Okay, next question. Um, from the audience, I often get asked to use the red, yellow, green color scheme. Yuck. Um, how do I convince people that this isn't a good idea, even so uh, they don't care about colorblind accessibility? Red, yellow, green? So like the stoplight color screen, color scheme. Is there like um, a messaging behind that? I'm just trying to understand, usually, right? Like green means go, red means all oh, alert. Like I'm wondering if there's a representation there. Yeah, like, is there a so point? In, in dashboards, you see it a lot where green means good or things that are going up, red means things that are going down or that are bad, and then orange is like they're bad, but they're not super bad, um, or, or yellow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I see it a lot and it is super problematic when dealing with color blindness because the red and the green look the same. And so the thing you're trying to communicate doesn't get communicated. And so the trick there is uh, double encoding, first of all. So if, if uh, up is green, then also have an arrow or something else that's not dependent on color to communicate what's going on. Um, so I'd say that's the first thing I would do. Um, now in scenarios where you don't have that connection or color is the only thing being used, then you just can't use uh, conflicting colors. 
So the, the green needs to become blue or the red needs to become something else. Um, we've actually played a lot with this because uh, our, some of our legacy tools use that stoplight scheme. And so we've shifted the values around to try and make it, well, it's green-ish and it's red-ish, but now it's not uh, conflicting hues. Um, but it is a challenge. And there are a lot of people that don't have colorblindness that say, that's stupid, I don't like that. And uh, it's, it can be a challenge to get them to empathize with uh, their audience. But um, uh, it's gotten easier. <laughs> People seem to care more now than they did five years ago. So actually, that's one of the most interesting problems in the field of visualization research, and that people are always talking about their rainbow color map perhaps being harmful. There have been a lot of tests of that. But the issue has to do with the reason that yellow color is used is because visually yellow is powerful as an alert system to our eyes. So if you're going to visualize along that entire spectrum, you can either use it to an advantage or you can show to your clients the disadvantage. The advantage is if you want to highlight particular areas in your middle range, uh, red, yellow, and green, that works kind of like uh, the diverging color map concept, whereas the central area is yellow. However, if you want to, I guess you want to say, to create a visualization lie, one powerful way is to use a lot of yellow in the middle of your visualization, because people are going to see that yellow more than they're going to see the red and the green, or they even the color deficiency will start to happen. So you can sort of show that to a group of people and sort of show them the differences and then try something like a purple and green color spectrum and show them what they might be able to that they might be able to gain more insight that's one way to do it there's a possibility but the yellow is one of the more interesting colors in terms of our visual spectrum and that's why they haven't stopped lights because when you see that yellow you will notice it as a caution more immediately Um, next question, when might you break the rules and go against the color best practices you've discussed? All the time. Art. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's form, right? Not form and function. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> I think Julia and Alan made a really good point of saying you really have to be sensitive to as to what your customer or what your um, viewing group of people want. So sometimes if they want to do something that's against the rules, break them because that's what they feel comfortable with. Try to create, show them alternatives in various different ways, but sometimes you have to break them with the double coding and those types of approaches to slide it by, slide the information by them by uh, double coding information or doing exactly what they're saying, but not necessarily doing what they're saying, if that makes sense. And I think too, like in my experience, you can definitely highlight certain things by breaking the rules, if you will. Like I um, give talks on design and I show how important contrast is just by putting like really dark gray text onto a black background. Because me misusing that is exactly the way I'm representing lack of accessibility to, to right? So the, it, again, it really depends on the audience. But I do for sure foray into like what I think would be the ugliest color palettes all the time because I find that extremely interesting. Like what are colors that are not appealing to me in combinations and combining them and, and just looking at it? I find that, I mean, I think that there some, somehow, sometimes there are happy accidents. Yeah, I would, I would just say it comes back to your goals, right? Uh, whenever you're creating a visualization, you need to keep your goals in mind. Is your goal to, to invoke emotion? Is it to, like, like with art, that's, that's usually one of the goals you have. Um, is it the clear communication of an idea or, or whatever? Those goals will always guide you. Um, and if you know what they are, you'll know when you can break the rules and when you can't. If, if it's in service of your goal, then do it. And if it's not, then you don't. Next question. Uh, can you explain the link between color and emotional response? And do you try to create certain responses from the reader through your visual through, through your visualization with color? 
you know so the connection I mean, between color and emotion so this is kind of an interesting one i don't if not going to answer the question directly it's going to leave you to think about it maybe um again growing up in in russia and going to the through the soviet education system um when you learn um the, when you learn math or language, they color code a lot of things. So like Russian vowels were red and the consonants were blue. And some of the, the odd numbers would become colors. And for me, it was kind of, I saw, um, you know, we would do multiplication and when they would color code all of the numbers, you'd be like, oh, I find this really hard because now we're dealing with odd numbers. And I would associate that with a blue color because the odd numbers were blue. I can't explain the theory behind this because I did not study this academically. So I'm sure there's like a psychological <laughs> example for why this happens. But definitely, I feel like I have been um, conditioned to associate color and emotion and response just by the way it was like it was almost like it's part of my curriculum which i find bizarre but that's ingrained heavily like i see um even numbers as red and odd numbers as blue <laughs> to this day color is also interesting go ahead teresa i was just saying color i think julia sort of saying color is a cultural thing i think you, that was alluded to some cultures have many more words for different uh Blue is across wa the water spectrum because that's part of their culture. They, li they live on an island. They need to know that entire spectrum. Others have different words for an, ag an agrarian economy, various uh, different types of dirt and soil to be able to understand that. So color is also a cultural thing. I'll give it back to you, Alan. Yeah, yeah. I, it's also very personal. Like, so one experience I had uh, when I was doing a lot of brand design and logo design is color was a big part of uh, branding. And I would come up with a brand. I remember one particular thing we were working with some greens because uh, we were, uh, it was for a food product and we wanted it to look fresh and, and this, and we showed it to the client and the response was, oh, I had a salad once that gave me food poisoning. It was that exact color. And so whenever <laughs> I see that color, I just, I, I can't deal with it. And so color is very personal. We all have created our own emotional links to very specific things. You know, it's a, that's the color of my grandma's favorite sweatshirt or, or this or that. And so when people like say like, well, color mean like reds mean this and blues means this and like, and if you have to take that with a huge grain of salt. Like that's a very general sense of color and it is probably not all that useful. And so, um, yeah, I, I would just say that. I, I will like, I, I can say that, I guess the, way, the other way I look at it is I think you can use certain, um, like uh, brightness as a good example. Like your really bright colors tend to communicate energy and um, uh, a more casualness where your dark, more subdued colors are more businessy and down to earth. Maybe, maybe I'm just doing exactly what I said not to do, but um, uh, I don't think you can get extract really specific emotions by finding some magical hex code that's going to you know, invoke that same emotion in every person. Every person is different. Yeah, I like this idea of kind of like an emotional color palette that we all kind of have just by living and having experiences. And because it's so, so strong, it, it would be really hard if I associate red with some particular thing, no matter what I'm supposed to, you know, but no matter what I'm supposed to elicit as a behavior, my emotional connection to that color is going to, I think, prevail. So I'd have to be like, I'd have to relearn or there'd have to be imagery supporting it for me to shift that perspective somehow, I think. I guess an answer I would have is in terms of serving a group of clients is to look around their particular space and see the colors that they are naturally choosing. And then to try to try to design your visualizations for what they prefer and they naturally choose. And you begin to develop sort of an, an instinct towards what their particular environment, um, what they like. One of the things I, I have a particular thing in myself called color memory, which means that if I go to a place very often, my 
mind can all of a sudden, if someone would say, hey, we're going to out to dinner to this particular place, I can match that color in what I'm wearing. And I can do that just not even knowing that I was, I mean, I was doing that when I was five years old. That means that I'm looking around, looking at all the different, the color combinations that are in a particular atmosphere. But that um, way of finding insight is actually helpful in terms of visualizations. You can watch people and what their choices are and choose your color palette to visualize towards what they would like to have. That's exactly what a really great fashion designers do, by the way. They kind of watch what people particularly like and they design for them. And at the end of the day too, I think for client work specifically, that's why I ask for those branding guidelines because the organization has already worked with the team to develop those guidelines and they have the colors that represent that organization. So they have avoided the pukey salad green because somebody there said no when they were doing their branding. So I feel like at least in client work specifically, that's usually a safe place to look for inspiration because they have put time into developing a color brand that reflects them if you're working with a client. I agree with you. You know, NVIDIA has their own NVIDIA green, for example. So if you're going to work for NVIDIA, it'd be a good idea to know what that NVIDIA green is rather than trying to match the green. Um, next question. Are there any recommendations for using color to convey uncertainty? Yeah, so I, there's, a, I, there's a paper that looked into this that I found uh, really interesting and it has it's not your conventional color schemes. Like, so I mentioned like sequential and diverging. This is like, um, and, and categorical, this is like uh, a mesh of a couple of those, but uh, basically it, it looked like a triangle, right? At the top of the triangle, you had uh, a gradient from uh, a very bright blue to a very bright red. And it, and it kind of went purple in the middle, right? And then as you went down to the point of that triangle, it became gray. And so saturation became the encoding for uncertainty. And so as things became less certain, they become less saturated. And there were also fewer hues to choose from, which helped communicate that. Like one of the problems I've seen with other visualizations that take this approach is they have a box with the same thing. And so you have it's purple or blue or red, and then it's just more gray versions of those things. This thing by drawing them to a common color at the very bottom of certainty, forced you not to read it like you can't read gray as a color because it doesn't have one um so i i thought that technique was was super strong um but I, i'm sure there are others well i guess the most common way to handle noting uncertainty is if there's a particular color scheme and then to choose the colors for uncertainty to have high contrast to that. So if you're doing, I think what Alan was talking about, a particular um, sequential color scheme, if you wanna put the diverging in there, let's say you have a, a blue color scheme that you're using a diverging blue color map. If you wanna put down uncertainty, let's go back, then you might put the areas a line or of uncertainty in orange because you have a big contrast between that particular data. That's, that's one approach to doing, uh, expressing uncertainty in a situation like that. You could also change this. So everything might be a bright color and then where your uncertainty is, you choose um, a, a, a subdued a color with a lot of gray in it. So it's a darker color than everything else. But in other words, to create a contrast. In in mapping, we have used, this is more again in academic publishing, but we've definitely used cross hatching for areas of uncertainty and just stayed away from color entirely. Obviously there's a legend that goes with that, but that was one way to just kind of, you know, drop out of using color and say, okay, this is, these are areas of, um, of consideration that require different thinking. That becomes the same thing as contrast. That's creating contrast again. Yeah. Just ways to create that contrast yeah i like the triangle and the gray that alan mentioned are you going to link that paper i think people are asking myself included yeah i'll i'll try to find it travis in the in the chat just mentioned it's called a value suppressing uncertainty palette so i think googling that'll 
bring it up, but I'll, I'll try and find it and link it in the notes. And there's been um, a couple of questions about like the best um, use of background color in dashboards and other visualizations and seeing a lot of dashboards with an all black background. What do you think about color, um, the color black being used as much as it does and dashboard or and um, background color in general? Yeah, uh, designing UI or charts or anything uh, with a dark background is totally acceptable, totally possible. Again, it has to do with the kind of look and feel you're going for, but it does require a kind of a reversing of your mental models. Um, so, uh, because the way we look at things is all contrast based. So black is the highest contrast with the white background and then the inverse is a true of black. So when you're designing on a dark UI, a dark background, you've got to think in terms of that contrast. How do I maximize something, uh, the, the contrast with the background? And when it comes to visualizations, uh, this has a lot of implications. You know, that blue is a really strong color you see in a lot of charts, uh, like on a line chart when the background's white because it has a lot of high contrast, but it does not with the dark background. And so that blue needs to be like a super cyan blue, or maybe you're better off with a yellow. Yellow is a very poor color choice for color contrast on a white background, but it's an excellent one when you've got a dark background. And so you've just got to shift your mental model to think in terms of color contrast instead of color value. Joseph Alvarez in his book um, called The Interaction of Color, there's actually an app related to it has some various exercises where he shows how color can change depending on the background that it's on. So if you have a, like you said, the blue example, and if you put it up against a black background, that color could actually change in terms of then if you put it up against a green background or something like that, that the color actually itself change, a color has, he says a color has many faces. My tendency in terms of trying to come up with neutral is not to go black or white, but to stay in the gray range. I, I tend to do that in terms of, because I sort of ran some of those Alvarez experiments myself and found that gray ten, tends to um, stay somewhat neutral with colors, but that might not be the solution you want if you want to emphasize something, because if you have something that's fading away or something that's doesn't isn't sharp enough that might not be what you want to do on your dashboard so depends on what you're trying to get at i think yeah and i i i will maybe counterpoint that a little bit and say that um as when you're working with backgrounds i i think they should be neutral and if they're going to be uh, a shade of gray they need to be either very light gray or very dark gray when you get into the mid ranges you can't achieve contrast ratio. If you have a 50% gray, you can't get white enough or black enough to have a high contrast with that. So you need to stay pretty light, pretty dark if you're gonna be successful uh, meeting accessibility standards. Indeed, I agree. Okay, last question. Um, is there one book, one or two books or other reading about color that you would recommend that people can follow up with? Interaction of Color by Joseph Albers, as well as the app. I actually, I think I wrote an um, article just recently that was published yesterday for the um, Nightingale with which regards to showing how to use that app, but I think it's a powerful app for learning about color and the book itself. Ellen, Julia, any other reading or resources to follow oh, up on? Of course, I could, you know, shamelessly promote my own book, but I won't do that. I mean, I do have a book, so. I mean, oh. Oh, like resources for me, it's just play. Like there's a bunch of leather strips on a black background that I could take a photo of and dump into a color palette. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really into um, how real life translates into the digital realm. <laughs> Yeah. That's what you might like. To, you might like the Alpers app because that's what the app tries to do. That. 
Um, yeah, for, for me, and maybe I have a very analytical mind. Uh, as a designer, all my design friends just kind of shake their head at me because I pull up my spreadsheet. I'm like, look at this. Uh, and so for me, it's all about learning how uh, to encode information with color. And so what, what Julia said is very true, experiment, play with it. Um, and uh, for me, a lot of that comes to, it, it's this circular feedback loop of, I use color to understand the data. And as I understand the data, I better understand how to use color to represent that data. And creating that feedback loop for me has been really useful. Um, and so you just find a tool that can create that feedback loop for you. Uh, you know, that could be uh, watercolor, it could be like working directly on paper and pencil with watercolors or whatnot, or it could be something like Tableau. So find something that can create that feedback loop for you where you're learning from yourself. And I think that is, that's the key for me. Yeah, I'm I think, go ahead. You go ahead. I was just gonna, I was just gonna say, um, I often, where possible, you know, if, if, especially with client work, ask if they have an audience um, working group that could test some of the product too and provide feedback. I think that, that you know, first round of, of, of comments is also really nice if you're trying to kind of brainstorm or test things. Um, and the same with, with colleagues. I, I do find that it's almost like this idea of A-B testing something where I have two groups and they say, okay, or even just feedback from, from friends. I think it can be casual as well. But I do think that, um, at least for me, um, bouncing ideas, color ideas off of um, other folks also helps because I gain insight into you know, something I may not even think of that someone else sees based on our personal experiences with color, I guess. Right. I, I'll amplify both what Julia and Alan are saying and that I'm a big proponent of trying to expand one's own visual literacy. I like to go out. I like to take long rocks to look and see how nature's done color. I like to go to museums and see how various artists do colors. I always try to look at the world around me and look at my experiences. So color is always clicking on my brain. I like to I happen to be somebody that dances a lot. I social dance, I ballroom dance, I social dance. I watch how um, the people I dance with, the color combinations that they choose to pick. It's various different ways. I'm always looking at particular, how people choose to combine color to learn from them, to expand my own visual literacy. I think we've hit time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, our next fireside chat is going to be on visualizing public health data responsibly. Um, so look forward to that in the next couple of weeks. And again, thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to everyone who's joined the chat today. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. This has been awesome. Yes, was, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Enjoy. Have a good day, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.